This month's Practical Techniques video is looking at how we measure enthalpy changes. In the video, we're going to look at two main experiments for measuring enthalpy changes, and these are both really in your kind of core practical that you need to be able to answer exam questions about. All enthalpy change experiments rely on one important idea. That is that water has a fixed property called specific heat capacity, which is given the shorthand symbol C. The specific heat capacity of water is 4.18 joules per gram per Kelvin. And this value will always be given to you in your exam or your test or as part of your data booklets. You may see it rounded to 4.2. And if this is the case, then this is the value that you should use. You can look at the units for specific heat capacity and you can see that they are 4.18 joules per gram per degree Kelvin. This means that specific heat capacity tells you the amount of energy in joules that is needed to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree. Therefore, in any experiment to measure delta H, you will need to measure the mass or amount of water that you use and the start and final temperature. You can then put them into the equation. Energy transferred equals the mass of water times the specific heat capacity times by the change in temperature. In some of the cases we'll look at, we may not have pure water. We may instead have a solution of acid or alkali or a solution of a metal salt. It doesn't matter, we're still going to make the assumption that the specific heat capacity is around the same. There are a few other things we can also do to make using this equation easier. Although the units of temperature in the specific heat capacity value are per degree Kelvin, because we're measuring a temperature difference, which is what is represented by delta T here, then we don't actually need to convert our values that we're going to take in degrees Celsius. So let's say we had an experiment where the initial temperature on a thermometer read 20 degrees, the final was 40 degrees, the difference is therefore 20 degrees. If I were to convert the initial and final temperature into Kelvin, the difference would still be 20. So it would make no difference to my calculation of energy transferred. Another thing that we can do to make our life easier is we don't normally measure the mass of water directly. And that is because under standard conditions, one centimeter cubed of water has a mass of one gram. It's easier to just measure the water using either a volumetric pipette or a measuring cylinder rather than try to weigh it out on a balance. We're also often going to make the assumption that if it's not pure water, if it's a solution like acid, or some sort of salt, then we're just going to assume that it has about the same density as water. The specific heat capacity equation, Q equals MC delta T, only allows us to measure the absolute value of energy transferred in a chemical reaction. And this is usually measured in joules. Molar enthalpy change, what we call delta H, shows the energy released or absorbed by a chemical reaction per mole. The units are always kilojoules per mole and enthalpy change always includes a sign, a plus or a minus. So to convert from the energy transferred, that raw number in joules into kilojoules per mole, we're gonna to need to do a few things. First, we need to turn, of course, our energy from joules into kilojoules by dividing by a thousand. And the other thing we need to do is work out the number of moles in one of the reactants used in the experiment. We can do this by using the mass if it's a solid or by using volume and concentration of a solution. We normally have more than one reactant. The other reactant will normally be in excess to make sure the reactant that we measure the moles of is completely used up in the reaction. Once we've calculated kilojoules per mole by doing kilojoules divided by mole, 
we add a positive sign for an endothermic reaction or a negative sign for an exothermic reaction. And we're going to decide that whether the temperature decreased, meaning endothermic, or increased, meaning exothermic. Those are the basics of how we use the equation. So how does that transfer to a practical experiment? Well, some reactions take place in solution, which means that measuring delta H is relatively simple. Examples of this type of reaction include displacement between metals, neutralization reactions, and also just dissolving. We can use an insulating polystyrene cup and a lid to minimize the heat loss. You should not, in an exam situation, say that this is to stop heat loss, as it's impossible to stop all the heat being lost from inside the cup. You could also talk about heat transfer, because of course it could be an endothermic reaction, in which case it's going to be heat going into the cup, not out. We could measure the solution using a balance, but it's more likely that we'll use a measuring cylinder or a volumetric pipette. And that's so that we know the volume and therefore the mass of solution that's being heated. We are then going to record the initial temperature of that solution, or it could be water if it's dissolving. If we're gonna add a solid, we can weigh it in a container so that we can weigh the empty container afterwards. We're going to add it to the solution and we're going to stir very quickly to make sure the reaction happens as quickly as possible. Alternatively, we could be adding another solution. We would record the highest or lowest temperature reached, depending on if it's exo or endothermic. And then we put all that information. We can work out our moles because we weighed our solid or we calculated something about the solution. We've got an initial and final temperature to give us delta T, and we know the amount of solution, the mass of water or acid or copper sulfate, whatever is inside the polystyrene cup. From that, we can work out a final value in kilojoules per mole. Although the polystyrene cup does reduce heat loss, it's still the main source of error in these experiments. And so therefore you should be aware of another common practical method that we can use to make our determination of delta T, the temperature change, more accurate. So first of all, instead of just recording the initial temperature just once at the start, we record the temperature of the solution in the cup every minute or so for a few minutes. And this is to ensure that the temperature is not increasing or decreasing because, for example, we may have just brought the solution out of a warmer or colder environment when we started the practical. We're then going to add or solid or solution that will react with the solution in the cup. And as before, we're going to stir to mix. At this point, we probably won't take a temperature reading because we won't have time but we will then continue to record the temperature every minute until we see the pattern that's shown on this graph here. So what will happen is the temperature will rise initially because the reaction will take place. And again, this is assuming an exothermic reaction, which is the most common. But once the reaction is finished, the temperature will start to fall. We can then use the results to plot the graph like the one we have here. We're going to put a line of best fit through the first few points, and that will give us a value for a sort of average initial temperature. And then the points on the right hand side of the graph, this decreasing line here, they show the rate of cooling, and that's a constant rate. So if we draw a line of best fit through these points, we can extrapolate back to the point at which we added the solid. That will tell us the highest point that the temperature could have reached if the mixture was not cons constantly losing heat to the surroundings. So this will give us a more accurate value for delta T that I can use in my Q equals MC delta T equation. The previous experiments have shown us how we might determine enthalpy change for a reaction that takes place in water or in a solution 
where we have aqueous reagents. But we also need to know how to measure enthalpy of combustion for different fuels. So here our setup is going to be different. Instead of a polystyrene cup, we're going to use a copper can, which is often called a calorimeter. And we may use a lid as well, although it's not shown in this diagram. The fuel is usually a liquid, like an alcohol, so we'll use it inside a spirit burner. Before the experiment, we're going to weigh that spirit burner with the lid on. This is important. With the lid off, the fuel will evaporate and the mass will be constantly changing. As before, we need to accurately measure the water we add to the can, because this gives us our mass of water that we're going to use in the mc delta t equation. We also, of course, need to take the initial temperature of the water, just like we have before. Once we've got it all set up and have recorded an initial mass for the spirit burner, a volume for my water and an initial temperature, we can light the spirit burner. We want to make sure that the flame of the spirit burner is touching the can for maximum heat transfer. So you may have to move the can in order to do that. We're going to heat the water for a set length of time or until a particular temperature is reached. We don't want to heat it too high because the water will start evaporating much more quickly at higher temperatures and evaporating is not the same as being heated up. It's actually going to be absorbing more water energy and that's not going to be shown in my thermometer. We can put the flame out therefore when we've maybe heated it by about 10 degrees and we're immediately going to put the lid on the burner to stop that evaporation of the fuel. We can then check the thermometer and we can record the highest temperature that is reached. We're going to also reweigh the spirit burner in order to just check what mass of fuel was used. That's going to be how we calculate our moles in our kilojoules per mole calculation. The main source of error in this combustion experiment is heat transferred to the surroundings. And by the surroundings, we mean anything that is not the water because water is involved in the Q equals MC delta T equation. So we could be talking about the air around the flame, but also the copper can itself. We can try and minimize it a little bit by putting heat mats around the flame to exclude drafts and by putting a lid on the can we're still going to get lots of heat loss in this experiment. Another big source of error is incomplete combustion of the fuel. This is particularly a problem for higher molecular mass fuels that don't burn as cleanly. So they're going to make more carbon and carbon monoxide. And you can see that by the buildup of soot on the bottom of the can in this experiment. A lot of the energy that's released in combustion, in complete combustion, is due to the high energy of the C double bond O that's made when we make carbon dioxide. So if we make carbon or carbon monoxide instead, we're not making as many of these C double bond O bonds and we are not releasing as much energy. A final source of error is evaporation of fuel from the wick. So we can minimize this source of error by keeping the wick quite short and also keeping the lid on that spirit burner at all times when we're not using it for actual combustion. Even if we try to minimize heat loss, the value we get for enthalpy of combustion will still be seriously underestimated. So when enthalpy of combustion values are calculated for the data book, they're often using an instrument called a bomb calorimeter. So in this, we have something called a bomb, which is a container in which the fuel is burnt inside the container that has the water in it. And this also contains pressurized oxygen to ensure complete combustion instead of just burning in air. Because the fuel is inside the calorimeter, heat is transferred more efficiently into the water. So although there will still be some heat loss, we even calibrate for this. And we do that by working out something called the specific heat of the whole apparatus.
So what we would do is instead of putting a fuel inside the bomb, inside the container, we would put an electrical heater. We can heat the water using this electrical heater and we know exactly how many joules of electrical energy have gone in because that's a calculation involving current and voltage and the time that we leave it for. We can then calculate how many joules are actually needed to raise the temperature of the water in this apparatus. So we no longer assume this 4.18 value, we actually work out the joules per degree for this particular calorimeter. And actually this is something we can do in our own experiment. If for example, we have a fuel where we know the enthalpy of combustion, we can work out how much energy has actually been transferred to the water and how much of it is lost to the surroundings.